So when I say they made a Teen Wolf movie, I should probably specify that I'm talking about the new one and not the ones that came out back in the 80s, just to clear up any confusion there. Those movies spawned an MTV remake that's basically nothing like them, and now that show, which has been off for six years, has its own movie, and I'm gonna talk about it. As you can see, this has been a pretty dry month for me, content-wise. I spent the entire month re-watching The Clone Wars, so I haven't had time to make any videos, and now I'm very clearly scraping the bottom of the barrel with this one. I should have just reviewed Severance. But I liked the Teen Wolf show for what it was. And by what it was, I mean a cheesy, typical teen drama with shitty pop music playing over all the sex scenes and 25-year-olds playing over sexualized teenagers. But this one had werewolves in it, so it's definitely not like the rest of them. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say I'm some big super fan, though. I watched the show as it was coming out, and I kind of dipped at some point because I lost interest, and then finally I finished the show years later, and I haven't really revisited it since. But when I found out they were doing a movie, I admit my curiosity peaked. Because, I mean, the series ended on a cliffhanger. The main villain of the last season was a hunter named Monroe who ended up escaping by the end, and we jumped some nebulous amount of time into the future to see that she's built some kind of sizable following. She's got a lot of followers. Like what, hundreds? Thousands. All over the world. The show ended with all the cast coming together for one last fight, implying that whatever continuation we might get would involve them taking down Monroe once and for all. So when I found out that this movie wouldn't be following up on that even slightly, nor would we see any more of that kid that Scott recruited at the end of the show, I was confused to say the least. And yeah, throughout this entire film, Monroe is never once brought up. There aren't any hunters after them, no silent war between the monsters and the humans that the last season kind of seemed to be setting up. The plot of this movie is about something entirely different, which we're gonna get to in a bit. And spoilers, by the way, for any of you secret Teen Wolf fans out there among my follower base who somehow haven't already watched this movie for yourselves. The other thing that was confirmed a while back that wasn't gonna be in this movie was Styles, aka the best character on the entire show and arguably the the heart and soul of the whole series. The whole last season had him barely in it, which I think had something to do with the Maze Runner movies happening at the time, and his absence was definitely felt. So when I found out he wasn't gonna be in the movie, I kind of just stopped caring. That was several months ago, and since then, this movie hasn't really been on my radar that much, but I realized it was coming out soon, and since I had nothing better to do with my life, I decided to watch it. And it was frustratingly bad. Don't get me wrong, Teen Wolf was never exactly peak television or anything. Again, I haven't watched it in years, but I have to imagine it would definitely not hold up all that well upon revisiting it. It had plenty of your bog standard world building problems, character problems, a severely bloated cast the further into the series we got, and all the other teen drama bullshit I already mentioned earlier. I'd honestly hesitate to call this show good outside of a couple of storylines. However, I think it would be safe to say that this movie is way way worse than anything the show ever did. And in a lot of ways, it's laughable. Like, there are several moments in this film where they're playing it 100% straight. I just could not take it seriously. The more of this there is, the less you can see. What is it? Darkness, you motherfucker! <laughs> Fair, that's always been kind of a staple of Teen Wolf. It really likes to take itself seriously, but more often than not, the shit that's happening is just too funny, so I really won't give this movie too much flack for that. It comes with the territory. I'm an alpha now. <laughs> What I cannot forgive this film for is the fact that it scrapped the entire plotline set up in the final season of this show just to reuse a villain who was already defeated and revive a character that was killed off in season 3. Yes, that's right. Allison is brought back to life by Scott, Lydia, and Malia by accident while they were trying to put her soul to rest because apparently it spent the last 15 years being trapped in limbo rather than moving on to the other side. Oh, yeah, it's been 15-ish years since the show, I guess or at least since Allison died, so maybe like 13 or 14 years. I'm not really clear on the timeline because Derek has a 15-year-old son in this movie who was never a thing in the show, even though he should have been born around the same time Allison died. But this movie also brings back the Nogitsune, which without Styles, I really don't see the point in doing. I mean, Allison was killed in the same arc, so I guess that's meant to be his connection to the main characters. But the thing that actually made him cool and interesting as a villain 
was Styles. It was the fact that he wasn't just some physical creature that the characters could defeat by wolfing out and beating him up. He was a foil to the smartest character on the show. He drove him to mental anguish. So if you're gonna bring back an old villain and you're not gonna continue the open plot line at the end of season six, then you should have gone with someone else because without Styles, this guy really isn't that compelling. I went ahead and rewatched that story arc after finishing the movie just to refresh myself on all the details I was fuzzy on, and it actually kind of made me hate this movie even more because it's hands down the best storyline on the entire show and has some of the most interesting lore building mythology. The Oni are a really cool threat to the characters and in the movie they're mostly just there. Like, they're actually kind of lame here. <laughs> the other big absence that was felt here was the lack of Kira, the character who was literally introduced to be the Yang to the Nogitsune Zien, so to speak. And if anyone other than Styles has a meaningful connection to this villain that they're forcing into the narrative, it would be her. Unfortunately, that couldn't have happened since the actress who played her left the show in season 5 rather abruptly, and she very vocally made it clear a while back that she wasn't going to be returning for this movie. She had one of the weirdest and most unnatural send-offs of any character in this entire series, and that unfortunately is the last we'll ever see of her, which is just another reason why bringing back the Nogitsune is meaningless. By the way, I realized that the way I worded that might make it seem like I blame Arden Cho for any of this, and that could not be further from the truth. In reality, I'm not really sure why she was written out of the show. It was pretty clear that she didn't want to leave, and was just as shocked as we were when it happened. And the reason she didn't come back for the movie was because of pay and equity among her and the rest of the cast, so honestly good for her for getting out of this when she could. I seriously wish her the best. Kira not being part of this movie also sucks because we, for some reason, spend a lot of time dealing with Scott's love life in this film, and specifically trying to rekindle the relationship he used to have with Allison, even though Kira was low-key way better as a love interest. And so now we're trying to get them back together. This movie ends with them saying that they always loved each other and they can finally be together at last, which is nice and all, though I do have a couple of questions, the most concerning of which being being... Did she continue to age while dead, parallel to the time that she wasn't alive for? Because if not, then this 30-something dude is hooking up with a 17-year-old girl. Allison's resurrection also comes with the inherent removal of the consequential impact that her death carried, and it absolutely affected my view of things while re-watching her death episode, because I knew she was gonna be back one day and everything would be just fine. And speaking of the frustrating impermanence of character deaths, the other main villain of this story is the old high school chemistry teacher that hated all the kids and was just generally kind of an asshole. You know, the one who died in season 3. And the film addresses that he was killed by a dark druid as a human sacrifice and even shows the mark on his neck where she cut his fucking throat but never really explains how he survived or was never discovered to be alive by law enforcement or anything else. And I mean, not only does that just seem logistically extremely unlikely, but... It also can't be true. His death served a major plot point in the series. The scary druid lady sacrificed him to gain more power. So if he didn't actually die, then that sacrifice doesn't count right? She doesn't get the power from that kill. Also, he's mad at the gang for what happened to him for some reason. I could be forgetting something from the show, like I said, it's been a hot minute, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have any reason to blame them for his death. They literally had nothing to do with that, so why does he want revenge on Scott? The two main villains in this movie are the absolute worst options they could have gone with. I honestly probably would have preferred the fucking Dread Doctors over this shit. Also, and I'm really not one who typically cares about about ships, but they have so many random pair-ups in this movie that just don't feel right. Like, we already talked about how they forced Scott and Allison back together and whether or not that makes sense logistically or if he's now dating a teenage girl, but they also have shit like Malia and Parrish being a thing now. When the fuck was that set up? Last I checked, she and Scott were a thing, but they had to undo that so that he could be single when this movie started, which, I mean, honestly, I'm fine with since I never really bought into their relationship to begin with. If anything, it always felt like she was set up to be with Styles, considering he was always pining after Lydia, even when she never showed any real interest in him and was constantly dating other guys. It seemed like the show was setting up their relationship as Styles' chance to move on from someone who just clearly wasn't into him. But he and Lydia did end up together, and then they broke up, 
off screen. Again, Dylan O'Brien wouldn't come back for this movie, so they decided to clunkily throw in a moment where Lydia explains why she actually broke up with Styles because she kept having these recurring nightmares that he would die in a car crash and figured the best way to prevent that would be to leave him. This isn't really ever paid off because, I mean, how could they without Styles actually being in the film? But then again, they could have just said that he was off doing really important FBI work and I honestly would have bought that just fine. Also, Jackson was there. I mean, that's all I can really say about him considering he did nothing but complain the entire movie and was just generally unhelpful until the very end, so that's... Actually, to touch on that a bit, this movie definitely did have that problem that I started seeing a lot in the later seasons of the show, which is that there are just way too many characters for all of them to have something meaningful to contribute. And considering how most of the characters weren't even in Beacon Hills when the plot got started, that would have been the perfect excuse to just not include some of them. The movie opens up in Japan as we find Liam working in a restaurant that's actually a secret supernatural hangout, I guess. And he has a kitsune girlfriend that we've never met before, and they're accosted by the evil chemistry teacher whose name I refuse to learn, who kickstarts the plot by attacking them and freeing the no kitsune. And then they don't show up again until like halfway through the movie, and they barely do anything. I kind of expected these characters to play a significant role in the story, considering they were the main focus of the opening scene, and one of them was a main character for like half half the show, but nah, whatever. I don't really have anything more to say. This movie just kinda agitated me more than I was expecting it to, so I had to get some of it off my chest. But it has so many more problems that it would take a much longer and more thorough video to break down, and I frankly don't have the time nor the energy to do so. Thankfully, I don't have to, because Friendly Space Ninja already made a pretty comprehensive video talking about why this movie is broken on every single level. So I'll link it down in the description and you can go check it out if you want. Let them know Papa Sheev sent ya. But, yep, yeah, fuck this movie, it's stupid, and I hate it. Uh, I was gonna give it a 4 out of 10, but I think that's honestly pretty generous, so instead I'm gonna give Teen Wolf the movie a 2.5 out of 10. G goodbye.